The moment is almost at hand. The time has almost finally come for WrestleMania 32 this Sunday. And look, from Jump Street, I'm just going to say it right now. For a year, I've been looking forward to WrestleMania 32. For a year, I had incredibly high expectations for the show. Although over the past several weeks, those expectations started to significantly be chipped away at and lowered, and I started to get this sense that I could be in for a massive, massive disappointment. And let's face it, based off of some of the major talking points, heading into this year's WrestleMania show, it's understandable. When you look at the injuries and who's not going to be there, I mean, we as humans can focus on the negativity anyways, especially as wrestling fans, but let's face it, there's no John Cena, there's no Randy Orton, there is no Seth Rollins. You know, there's not a lot of guys, <laughs> no Cesaro, um, you know, you look at it, no Luke Harper now, no Neville. I mean, so for different people, different types of fans, these are a lot of uh, guys that just aren't there, that just aren't available. You know, and when you look at it, you say, man, that's a lot to overcome. And you start to think that there is a lack of star power. And in theory, when you look at some of those big names, in particular those names like the Cena's and the Orton's and the Rollins that over the past several years have had so much invested into them, you know, uh, could you ever imagine a WrestleMania, especially a WrestleMania like this at a venue like this, trying to draw a crowd like this, where you weren't going to have any of those guys involved in an actual match on the card? I mean, so, you know, there's reason for concern, and you look at the fact that, you know, the, the buildup at one point in time you thought was leaning towards Rock versus Triple H at Mania, and that's not happening this year. Stephanie McMahon versus Ronda Rousey, that wasn't happening this year. You know, so a lot of that stuff that seemed to be set in motion a year ago, now you look at it and it's not coming to fruition, and when you combine that with the really lackluster buildup, in particular that period of time between Fastlane and and WrestleMania 32, it's easy to understand why myself, a lot of other people, have very, very low expectations and in theory could feel like we're in for a big disappointment come Sunday night. Because when you really look at it, honestly, you feel like there's really only three matches that you even care about. And even one of those three matches, you're talking about the WWE World Heavyweight Championship match. God only knows, I guess God does only know, uh, how the people are going to respond if and when Roman Reigns wins the title. Then you've got Shane McMahon versus Taker, where the storytelling has been absolutely atrocious. And even though you know it's Hell in a Cell, even though you know it's going to be a crash test dummy fest of all else, you know, it's either Shane loses and you're disappointed or Taker loses and you're disappointed. It almost in a way going into it feels like a lose-lose situation. Yes, you've got Lesnar versus Ambrose, but while people might be... Uh, excited, especially the Brock bots, to see Lester and Mania and see him win. You know, a lot of people at the same token are going to be very disappointed if a Dean Ambrose doesn't win at a featured event like this. You know, so I can understand. But then when we take a step back and get away from our own perceptions and uh, beliefs about this show, the reality can be somewhat different. There is still a lot of star power. You've still got The Undertaker. You've still got Brock Lesnar. You've still got Triple H. You've still got Shane McMahon. That's a pretty good star power foundation and basis. Looking at a lower level, you've still got guys like Chris Jericho. You've still got guys like AJ Styles. You know, you look at the tag teams like the New Day. You know, in terms of modern stars for the company, that's about as hot as it gets. You know, knowing that The Rock's going to be involved in some way. The belief that there could be a couple of surprises. Maybe Cena gets involved somehow in this show. You know, maybe somebody like a Seth Rollins, you never know, gets involved in the show. And Austin gets involved. And HBK maybe makes an appearance. Vince McMahon makes an appearance. There's still a lot of star power there. And there's enough star power for a WrestleMania. There really is. We can focus on the names that aren't there at this time. But the fact is there are a lot of names that are still there. And they are some big names to boot. If I told you in any given year you could build a WrestleMania around Undertaker, Brock Lesnar, and Triple H, you're going to feel really damn good about that. And you throw in a Shane McMahon, that is just an added freaking bonus. And then when you look at the fact that several of the marquee matches are going to have extreme stipulations, you know, whereas the build-up to it has been the, at the end of the day, the execution of the show within in its self-contained night 
you know, could be really, really good. It is really, really hard, except see Undertaker Boss Man at WrestleMania 15, that Hell in a Cell match. It could be really, really tough to have a bad, terrible, extreme stipulation match. I'd be stunned if Brock Lesnar versus Dean Ambrose didn't go over really, really well. I'd be absolutely floored if Shane McMahon versus The Undertaker inside a Hell in a Cell wasn't a great match. And frankly, especially if it ended up being where Triple H and Roman Reigns at the 11th hour was a no-disqualification match, I'd be stunned if that one didn't end up going over to a certain degree in a certain way. And then you throw in the IC title ladder match, and there's a lot of chances to fool people into thinking it's a great night full of great match quality because all this crazy phenomenal shit could happen. And when we look back at it, too, you know, as we start to analyze, there really, you could argue, would be six matches that fans are ultimately going to care about, not just three. I think a lot of fans are going to care about the Divas title match, and understandably so. I think a lot of people are still going to care about that IC title ladder match because of some of the people involved, and again, I think understandably so. I think a lot of people will still care about Chris Jericho versus AJ Styles, even though they've wrestled several times. Because that feels still like, to a degree, even though it lost some of the elements of what it should have had for that night, it still has that element of it's Chris Jericho, it's AJ Styles, that mid-card match at Mania that's about two personalities, it's about two great performers, it's not about titles, it's about pride, ego, who's the better man. A lot of good Manias will have that type of match. And this year's show has that type of match in these two guys. You don't need the extreme stipulations. You don't need this. You don't need that. If anything, that Styles-Jericho match provides necessary and needed balance to the card. So you can sit there and say you've got six matches to care about. And the fact is, it's still WrestleMania. And this is a WrestleMania, especially for those people like me that are going to be watching on the WWE Network. It's going to be a WrestleMania where you're watching. It's going to be an AT&T Stadium, that magnificent shrine to Jerry Jones' ego, where you're going to have over potentially 100,000 people there. Imagine if that crowd gets hot early. Imagine if that crowd gets interested early. Imagine if that crowd gets excited early. Imagine how that affects the overall feeling and presentation of the show. You throw in the Hall of Fame event and everything else. I mean, it's still WrestleMania. And for a lot of the people that crapped on the event heading into it, but are going there, they know that going to it live is going to be an entirely different experience and will sometimes fool them into thinking it's a lot better than it was. See, last year as an example. So when it all comes to pass, I guess maybe this is foolish optimism or foolish hope, and maybe you're surprised you're getting it from me, maybe you're not. But I really think there's a chance for this show to deliver in terms of its own self-contained night, in a surprising way. I would not be surprised if we came on Sunday night and a lot of people were praising the show and saying, I can't believe WWE pulled it off. You know, this saved WWE for me. This WrestleMania was awesome. This was better than 31, better than 30. Um, this is the best WrestleMania they had in years. I realistically, legitimately expect that to be the case. And frankly, I would be surprised if that wasn't the case. Now again, anything goes. Who knows what can happen? And there's still a lot of ways for the WWE to drop the ball here, a lot of ways for them to screw it up. It can come in a lot of different forms. But a lot of the pieces are still in place for this to be a very, very powerful and successful night for the WWE and a quite enjoyable night for us as WWE fans looking to WrestleMania to give us something. I think this show can give us a lot, actually. Now, in terms of the actual show itself and the car, when you look at the pre-show, you know, if anything else, it's good that people get matches. You know, that's why I look at the Divas tag. I still think it's hilarious that they brought back Eva Marie and plunked her with the Team Total Divas, and they thought she was actually going to get a babyface reaction. Now, that was hilarious. But at the end of the day, at least you found a way to give multiple Divas matches on this card. I have no problem. It's on the pre-show. It's where it belongs. It's one of those good kind of warm-up acts. Same thing with the, apparently, I think the U.S. title will be on the pre-show as well, and that's really where it belongs with Ryback and Kalisto. There's just not enough interest there. There's just not enough excitement there to sit there and make this a, a main card match. There just isn't. If I'm going to choose eight matches to feature on the actual main four-hour show, that U.S. title match, a Divas tag match, they're not going to be part of that. Same thing with the Usos and the Dudleys. My bigger disappointment with this 
is that this type of storyline should have played out on the main WrestleMania card. And in particular, when you're looking at with the tag team match between the New Day and League of Nations, and the fact that it became a handicap match and not a match for the titles, that's disappointing. You had the Dudley Boys. You had teams like the Usos. You had a team like the New Day with guys like Xavier Woods and Kofi Kingston. You, know, you could throw the League of Nations in there. Fuck it. You had this clear and present opportunity to go all in, and it would make so much sense 15 years after WrestleMania 17, now especially with the Dudley Boys involved, to sit there and do a TLC match for the tag titles. Would you rather have an IC title ladder match or a TLC tag title match? I will take the TLC tag title match any fucking day of the week. I think this is a horrible misuse of both the Usos and the Dudleys, and it is a shame that they are going to be wasted on the pre-show and relegated to the pre-show when this issue between them could have been a lot more and could have been a lot more interesting, especially tying in the Roman Reigns component and the fact of what you actually are doing with your two featured tag teams at the big show on the main card. It's just a disappointment and a lost opportunity, in my opinion. Now, in terms of the main card, I think a lot of this is going to come down to the start of the show how the show is structured, how the show is laid out, how the show is presented. The first and most important thing the WWE must do is take its time early. The past few years at WrestleMania, they've had a really bad habit of rushing like gangbusters through the first hour and trying to throw out a bunch of shit. And what happens is, is they naturally create a bit of a lull between hours one and two where they've got to slow things down significantly because they poorly manage their time. They cannot poorly manage their time here. They need to be crisp, they need to be sharp, and they need to be on point. This show needs to have consistency of its flow. You know, obviously you're going to have some ebbs and flows, but instead of it being like it's this, and then you go right down here for an hour, you got to sit there and try and maintain some type of level consistency here. Because if you do, it could really build up into a phenomenal crescendo for the course of the night. But again, I think a lot of it comes down to show structure. And in terms of how I look at the show structure, here's how I personally, my opinion, feel the night would go best in terms of structuring out the eight matches. You kick off with the IC title ladder match, go right into Crash Death Dummy Season. Then you follow that off, you balance it out with AJ Styles versus Chris Jericho, where th this company needs that match, where it should be on this show. Second is the perfect place for it. Then you go Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal because that will feel different than both the IC title ladder match and then Styles and Jericho. You put right in the middle of the show, Divas title match is going forth. It's a triple threat. So again, that match will have an entirely different feeling than the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. It will have a lot different feeling than the match that I would put on fifth, which is Dean Ambrose versus Brock Lesnar in their street fight. Um, that's where it needs to be. It either needs to be fourth or fifth. And I could sit there and come up with a couple of different ways. This is just the best way to me, I think, to balance out the big matches, to balance out the flow and the feeling of the night. I'll throw in New Day and League of Nations in their handicap match sixth, because at the end of the day, unfortunately, this is one of the two matches that just really doesn't matter that much on the main card. I'm just using that again as a time filler, as a space filler, if nothing else, and something to transition you onto the big matches of the night. But I look at it, the New Day deserve a high place on the card for their performances over the past year, and this is a good spot for them. When it comes down to the last two matches, I think you've got to go WWE World Heavyweight Championship and then Shane versus Take or Hell in a Cell. There are logistical things here where having the Hell in a Cell match second to last or third to last doesn't necessarily make a ton of sense. You would almost have to put it on in the middle of the show. And when you look at the performers involved with Shane and Taker, when you look at the stakes that are on the line, you could argue that the stakes are much bigger than what Triple H and Roman Reigns are wrestling over, which is the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. You're talking about control of a brand versus a WrestleMania legacy and a WrestleMania career potentially ending. And when you look at the names of the performers, Shane McMahon, Undertaker, is a bigger deal than Roman Reigns versus Triple H. And that's just the truth of the matter. And especially if you get that sense or you get that fear that the crowd could potentially shit all over this. And you don't want that lasting image and legacy of WrestleMania 32 being Roman Reigns getting booed out of the fucking building when you're not intending him for, for him to be, by the way, as the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. You need to produce that go-home happy moment. You need to give that match at the end that will send the fans home happy, so to speak. And the match that would be most likely to do that on this show 
is Shane McMahon versus The Undertaker inside Hell in a Cell. And when all comes to pass, if I'm telling you you're booking WrestleMania and you're in charge of WrestleMania, what match are you going to put all of your chips in on? If you say, I've got to count on one match to ultimately be in a position to make the night special or to save the night, or at least, if nothing else, send the fans home happy, who are you going to trust the most? Some of you may say Triple H, but there's that Roman Reigns component. I think that's risky. Some of you may say Dean Ambrose versus Brock Lesnar, but a street fight with really nothing on the line should not be main eventing WrestleMania 32, and I think we all know that. At the end of the day, you're going to count on Shane McMahon and the style of which you know he's going to come to that event with, that match with, and you're going to count on The Undertaker. The real WrestleMania, no offense to Shawn Michaels and even Hulk Hogan, the other two guys that you really could throw into that category, the real Mr. WrestleMania is The Undertaker, period. He is WrestleMania more than any performer the company ever has had and, frankly, ever will have. And when it comes down to it, out of a respect factor, out of an importance factor, out of a significance factor, uh, the stakes that are on the line, if I'm gambling on anybody, I'm gambling on The Undertaker in this spot at this moment, period. That match has to main event. It must main event. I think the WWE, frankly, is crazy if they trot it out there in the middle of the night or they sit there and put on that WWE World Heavyweight Championship match last. That's just the way I'm looking at it at this point. Now, oh, it kind of sucks in a sense. You're trying to make this Roman Reigns' big signature moment, his crowning achievement, and he won't main event. But putting him on main event could be a disaster for all parties involved. Putting it on second to last? You know, while a lot of people will be pissed and a lot of people will do this, if I had to choose two guys to follow that up and save the night, it's going to be Shane McMahon versus The Undertaker. You don't want to run the risk of unintentionally pissing people off so bad that they crap all over your event and their lasting legacy is that they're pissed off at what the hell you did. Not pissed off in the sense that they now want to pay money to see Roman Reigns as a heel, when frankly, if we are looking at this from a larger perspective, similar to Cena, Cena turned heel a decade ago. Roman Reigns is already a heel. Turning him heel would actually make him face, and I've talked about this shit before, and again, I'm going to emphasize the crap won't work. He already is a heel. Period. It's just all the messed up dynamics of everything when it comes to WWE. But when it comes to how this show should be structured, you got to put that Lesnar Ambrose street fight right there in the middle of the show because that could be a huge pick me up. You put on that WWE World Heavyweight Championship match, second to last, you got to go home with Shane versus Undertaker in the Hell in a Cell. There's too much at stake, especially if Shane loses. You know, you got to have that moment. And people will still be somewhat happy that Undertaker won. But if Undertaker lost, and it was potentially his last WrestleMania match, what an insult to The Undertaker, his fans, to his legacy, to WrestleMania, to stick that in the middle of the fucking car. That is astoundingly ridiculous and incredibly stupid and would be one of the ultimately most reckless and idiotic decisions that Vince McMahon, who ultimately will make the decision of what is booked where, it'd be one of the most foolish things this company would ever do. In terms of that IC title ladder match, there's only two guys that should win this. Two guys. You can take your Zami Zanes and blow it. You can take your Dolph Ziggler's and fuck it. And let's do this one more time. WrestleMania style! <laughs> fuck Dolph Ziggler! Only two guys should be entertained as winning this. To me, at the end of the day, this should be a big spotlight moment and an opportunity for Kevin Owens. Because if you are going to go with Roman Reigns as a champion, you probably are going to send him on a lengthy title reign. You need to be envisioning potential opponents for him down the road. Kevin Owens could be potentially one of those natural opponents for him. You must give him a signature victory here. You must give him a big spotlight moment here. Kevin Owens needs to retain. The only other person that I would argue for with a completely and serious straight face that should win this match is Zack Ryder. And the reason I say that this is a guy that has put in his time over the years. This is a guy that has done a lot for this company in terms of helping them really truly enter the social media age that the WWE now finds itself in. A lot of that comes as a result of Zack Ryder. Here's a guy that when he was finally given his opportunity, when he was starting to try to do something, they put him in the most idiotic, ridiculous situations ever, and he's been buried for the past five years. 
but he stayed loyal and he still comes to work. He still tries to do the best that he can out of respect for him, respect for what he tried to do to help this company, out of respect to his fans that maybe still want to have a reason to care for him, but they have lost a reason to care for him. Would it really be that bad if Zack Ryder got this moment at WrestleMania 32? Would a lot of people really be that upset if Zack Ryder got this chance at WrestleMania 32? And the answer is, I don't think so. You know, when you talk about a Sami Zayn, you can go there at some point in time. But frankly, when it comes from a WWE main roster standpoint, he hasn't fucking earned this moment yet. And a Dolph Ziggler? Fuck that. Miz, you've been there before. Sin Cara? Bitch, please. Stardust? Not as long as he's Stardust. The only other guy that should be sniffing this opportunity is Zack Ryder. And it's the only way I wouldn't crap on this match and its finish if it wasn't Kevin Owens, was if it was Zack Ryder and he got his WrestleMania moment. And for me, I could make almost as strong of an argument for him, at least from a short-term standpoint, that Zack Ryder should win this match even over Kevin Owens. Because at some point in time, I think there is something to be said about a respect factor. There's something to be said about rewarding those loyal employees that have been there for years. For those guys that helped usher in some good changes for you as a company, it's kind of an apology. It's kind of a way to say, hey, you know, thanks. Hey, you deserve this. Hey, you know, the fans, every once in a while, we'll give you fucking something. Well, might feel like it's five years too late, but it's better late than never. And I will advocate and push for Zack Ryder getting this shot here. But at the end of the day, it really should be about Kevin Owens. And this should be Kevin Owens' spotlight night. To sit there and have one of these other guys like Zayn or Ziggler win it is a pathetic attempt to appeal to these fucking hardcore fans who frankly don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And they know it would be bullshit, period. Ziggler's had that opportunity and fucking squandered it multiple times. Sami Zayn does not deserve that spotlight, did not deserve that moment yet. And frankly, there's a lot more appeal there post-WrestleMania if you had Kevin Owens retain and Sami Zayn came home so close and then you wanted to go there as opposed to Zayn just gets the fucking belt at WrestleMania and now Kevin Owens is trying to get it back. That's my opinion. You know, Styles, Jericho... Everybody assumes, I'm sure, that AJ Styles is going to win and that's probably what's going to happen. To me, there's almost more intrigue there if you had Chris Jericho win, maybe. But but I think it needs to be uh, Styles. My concern about this match is it's not going to get the time that it needs because the WWE is going to try and rush through that first hour, and they're going to try and get three, if not four, matches done immediately within the first hour, the first hour and 15, 20 minutes. And I'm afraid instead of this match getting 18 to 20 minutes that it deserves and that it needs to properly and fully tell the story that it needs to tell, it's going to get 10 to 12 and people are going to get caught up in the bullshit of the fact that it's these two guys wrestling and that makes it great and awesome when you're ultimately going to get that lingering feeling of disappointment that it should have been so much more than it ultimately was. In terms of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, I guess at the end of the day, does it really fucking matter who wins? Because they had Big Show win it last year and they didn't do anything with him with that. Two years ago, they had Cesaro win it, and they were on the cusp of doing something nice with him. So, of course, they stuck him with Paul Heyman and gave him a fucking heat magnet when you're trying to make him somebody that the people can rally behind. And it was fucking stupid. I told you it was stupid. And, of course, it proved out to be fucking stupid. This year, if you the way they're presenting it almost makes it seem like that Kane is going to win this. And, again, it's not like they really have a great reputation of doing anything to launch somebody with winning this Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. You know, and it should be that way. It should be something that could build somebody up. But if you're not going to do that, then you're not going to do that. And at this point in time, yes, a lot of people make crap on it. But there's a respect factor there for Kane. You know, and the fact that this is a guy that's been around almost 20 damn years now. Actually has been around 20 damn years now. And this is a guy that's done a lot for the company for many years. He's been a reliable, steady, trusted hand. I will tell you this much. A lot of people might think think differently, but I don't give a fuck. If they had Kane win this Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, I'm fine with that. If they went with the Texas kid Mark Henry, obviously myself and none of you would have a fucking problem with that. This would have been a great moment or opportunity to sit there and have had Neville get this big spotlight either in this match or maybe in that IC title ladder schmaz, one of the two. But if they have one of the veterans win, that's pretty cool. 
You know, there's a part of me that sits there to say, you know who I'd fucking like to win this just as a one-off kind of fuck it? Bring Goldberg back and have Goldberg blow through people and have him fucking win the goddamn thing. Why not? They're not doing anything with it after the fact anyways. They're not really following up on it any goddamn ways. So why not do something that creates a, a memorable WrestleMania moment for one of these veterans or somebody like that? Why not? The Divas title match I am excited for, especially the thought of Sasha Banks winning the belt. You know, it's one of these things that you've been building this for some time. We've anticipated this coming, and we, it, it did happen. And this is an important moment for this women's Divas division, whatever it's going to be called going forward, to sit there and really make a name for themselves and establish a brand. This match here to me, as much as anything else, is about branding what the women of WWE are going to be in the future going forward. That's what this is about. It's not about just the match quality. It's not just about who wins the match and what happens. It's about what type of brand are you going to establish for the women of WWE going forward. So this is an incredibly important match. It's one of the more important women's matches we have seen in many, many years, in my humble opinion. Especially if you have Snoop Dogg get involved. WWE, I implore you one more time. Ric Flair is going to be there. For his daughter, Sasha Banks, is related to Snoop. Snoop is going to be there. What better way to incorporate one of your Hall of Famers in this year's class than to have one moment in time where Ric Flair gets involved and Snoop Dogg spears the shit out of him. Give me that! And this match will be epic and fucking awesome and something memorable. And when you think about it, think about this. When you talk about establishing a brain and talking about the importance of the Divas Revolution, the fact that you would devote a Ric Flair and a Snoop to a women's match is a huge statement and a powerful statement and a very effective statement at that about the real importance of women going forward in this company. They, frankly, they need to carry a more important role than they have in the past several years because the WWE, as they so often do, are dropping the ball and missing a huge opportunity. We need Snoop! Snoop can make it happen. Snoop can make all the difference in the world and really tie this together. That Ambrose Lesnar street fight... I'll just say this really quickly. Sorry, Brock Bots. Ambrose has to win. Ambrose needs to win. Ambrose must win. It's a street fight. No holds barred. You can do whatever the fuck you want. Having Brock Lesnar lose here isn't going to hurt him. If anything, it's going to help him. Because Ambrose, who is a guy that a lot of people like, had to go through hell and back just to barely be able to beat the dude. Just to barely be able to beat the dude. If you sit there and do some washout bullshit where the Wyatt family interferes and costs Lesnar the match, that's fucking stupid. If you have Lesnar sit there and take all this shit kicking from Ambrose and then he still wins, then it's like, what the fuck is the point? When is anybody ever going to beat Lesnar? And that's not in a good way. And that's fucking stupid too. You need to make this a big moment for Ambrose. And no, this is not an example of him working with Lesnar is good enough because that elevates him. That's the type of lousy fucking excuse making people like me did for years to defend the streak still continuing was saying, hey, you got to work with The Undertaker at Mania, CM Punk. It doesn't matter if you beat him or not. Yeah, it kind of does. It's what we used to selfishly defend the streak and justify the streak continuing for as long as we fucking wanted it to. And you're not going to tell me any different. In this case, this is a moment in time when Ambrose needs a mania moment. You need to establish him as a top dude. The only way you're establishing him as a top dude is if he beats Lesnar here. I don't give a fuck if you go back the next month of Extreme Rules or later on in the month of Extreme Rules and Lesnar beats him again. Who cares? That's fine. But the match that mattered, the match that everybody's going to remember with this story and with these two is right here at this moment in time. And how stupid are you going to look? This big feature one-on-one -on -one match with Ambrose at WrestleMania and you have him fucking lose. That's just dumb. Speaking of dumb, what they did with the tag titles here and the fact that they're not defended on the show is dumb. The fact that it's New Day having to wrestle League of Nations, a tag team with no heat on them, in a 4 out of 3 handicap match, it's just a colossal waste of fucking time. And if they don't have the New Day go over here, fucking shame on them. What better way to reward one of the best acts you've had consistently over the past year than to have them job out to the League of Nations at 32? How stupid is that? And when it comes to the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, we've talked about that at great length. You know, we could have all of our opinions on it. But the fact of the matter is, everybody wants to discredit Roman Reigns. But the fact is, a lot of people loved last year's main event with him and Lesnar. 
you can sit there and give Lesnar all the credit in the world, and you can sit there and credit the finish with Seth Rollins cashing in all that you want, the Schlegel finish, if you will, the last year's Mania. But Roman Reigns was still there, and he was still an integral part of that main event. And when there was all this doubt about him, and when all the chips were on the line, and a lot of belief that he was going to fall flat on his face, he didn't. He stepped up and performed in a big way. And when you look at the fact that he's in the ring with a far superior performer to Lesnar for being honest in Triple H, a ring general like a Triple H, there's a chance that this match could be really, really goddamn good. I do think it needs the no disqualification stipulation because you can get people involved. These guys can do things. Just making this a standard match does not make a lot of sense because it really provides limitations in terms of what you can do. In order to have this have any chance in the world of working, you've got to make this a no disqualification match. It has to be that way. It has to be. It's the only way it is going to work. Now, some will sit there and say that it would be great at this moment an opportunity if Rock came out and Reigns fucking leveled the Rock and said, fuck you, you know. But the fact is, Roman Reigns is already heel anyways, and, and I don't need to talk about that anymore. I can't wait to see what happens in this match. The morbid curiosity is there for me with this match more than it is any other. Because I wonder if this one match is going to ruin the night for the WWE and is going to ruin the night for a lot of fans, which would be a shame if it did. In terms of Shane McMahon versus The Undertaker, Hell in a Cell, I don't know what to think. Is there a part of me that wants to see Shane McMahon continue to be on TV? But I don't want to see The Undertaker lose at WrestleMania either. Some might feel it's a win-win situation. I kind of feel like it's a lose-lose situation. But again, I will reemphasize that the storytelling heading into this has largely been terrible. I cannot believe Vince McMahon has not named himself the guest referee for this match. I wouldn't be surprised if that was actually announced this weekend or at the WrestleMania event itself because it, it needs to. It's what would make sense. Um, I would be surprised if somebody else didn't get involved here at some point in time along the way. Uh, you know, it's just one of these deals where it's just going to be a match. It's going to happen. And there's going to be a lot of crazy shit. And this is the match that has got to end this night. All the chips are on the line. This is the match. These are the people that you have to count on and believe in to deliver the goods and send the people home happy. This is the match, in theory, with the most on the line. This is the match with the most importance. And if this is to be... The Undertaker's last WrestleMania match, on the one hand, I feel like it's kind of a shame that it's wasted here. It's kind of a shame that they had to bring in a Shane McMahon because, frankly, they didn't have anybody legitimately to face Undertaker at WrestleMania to retire him from Mania. But if it is his last match, what a journey and what a path. And I guess we'll find out on Sunday what's going to go down. I still have hope that the WWE is going to deliver. And I think, in spite of all the perceptions that we have, uh, all of what we've been talking about for weeks and months even, this show could be really, really good. Now watch Sunday night, this company proved me wrong, but I'm going to have faith that this company wouldn't possibly find a way to screw this night up. Too important too much on the line, too many eyeballs, too much mainstream com coverage to sit there and screw this fucking up. This could be a really good night. It's time to fasten your safety belts and buckle up, baby, if you will. It's almost WrestleMania time, baby.